We have updated test results on the Tesla Model 3's braking performance. We talk about the new Kia Sorento 3 row SUV, and we answer a viewer question about hybrid engine longevity, next on Talking Cars. Hi everyone and welcome back. I'm John Lincove. I'm Mike Quincy. And I'm Jake Fisher. And after last week's mega Tesla episode, we actually have some new news about the Tesla Model 3. And no soliloquy, I'm gonna dive in. Jake, what is going on with the Tesla Model 3 since we had our report on not recommending it? Um, well, uh, so we were, so I had a conversation with Elon Musk and he mentioned that as soon as the weekend that he this was- This past weekend, this, yep. This last weekend that he was looking at putting out updates for the vehicle to address the problem that we found with the brakes. And lo and behold, we got an update this weekend and a lot of other Tesla Model 3 owners got updates mm -hmm. as well. Uh, we were able to verify that and we were able to test the vehicle uh, earlier this week. And, and Just for everyone, I mean, everyone knows about Tesla, we know, but just for that one person who's under a rock, it's an over-the-air update, Stop right? Stop insulting these people. Well, you know. <laughs> I'm telling you. Um, yes, right. So it's an over-the-air update. Um, they were able to, I mean, it's kind of a crazy thing, right? We had brake, brake issues. Uh, we were looking at about 152 feet from 60 miles per hour in a panic stop. Um, that's really long. Like that's pickup like, truck long. That's pickup truck long. Uh, Tesla had told us that, well, we're seeing more like 133 feet. 133 is actually really typical for the class. Mm -hmm. um, we're like, well, we're not seeing that. Why we're saying that, blah, blah, blah. Um, they put an over the air update to our Model 3 as well as the whole fleet of Model 3s out there uh, to address braking. Right. And so just one thing, you know, the blah, blah, blah means we're not going to rehash the whole episode from last week. You can go to episode 152 and, and hear all about what happened. Right, right, right. right. So they sent an update to the Model 3s. And, you know, look, um, the claim was they were able to shorten the stop instances mm -hmm. over the air. And a lot of people have asked me in that time, is that possible? How do you make the car stop better over the air? Um, well, we were very interested in ourselves yeah. too. Yeah. So we ran the test and lo and behold, uh, not 152 feet, 133. And we ran our full battery of braking. We did the full so battery. It wasn't like one we stop did, verified. We did, right, exactly. We did the dry, the, the, uh, the dry brake procedure, the wet brake procedure, the whole, whole thing. And it was consistent. We didn't have any of the variability that we saw before. And yeah, it's, it's, it's right kind of what we would expect for a car like that. And it has a huge impact on the score. In fact, uh, we were not recommending it mm -hmm. at, before the update. Um, I can tell you right now that we will be now recommending this car so it, uh, because it improved that much. So it boosts the road test score, which correlates to boosting our, its overall score. Right, exactly. So we have an overall score of each of the vehicles that you know incorporates lots, you know, everything that, about the vehicle. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it made that much of an impact. And um, you know, it's quite amazing that they were able to do that. Um, I guess the, the question is, how can they do that? Right, right. and they're not open telling it well, exactly the well, they ins are, and outs. Actually, so I mean, we went back and we asked them. We said, "What did you do oh. to to make an update?" I mean, obviously, you're not putting different tires on or brakes. Sure, or, it's not a physical; it's all electronic. And you know, it's uh, so it was as kind of expected. Was look, there's a computer system that that controls the anti lock brake system mm -hmm. on every car, yep. not just Teslas. Uh, and what they were able to do is change that software. So it reacts better to changes in the environment. So for instance, if the tires heat up or the brakes heat up or you're on a hot day or a cold day or a slick surface, it's now a little smarter in reacting to those changes in conditions. And those changes translated into a much better, more consistent stopping in our test. Just tires or rotors, pads, the whole Well, look, I mean, kit. so many things can change in terms of your braking performance. Right, right. I mean, if you go out on the ice, you know, or the or wet surface, or, you know, how many people have driven on that road can completely change right. the friction surface of that road. So all of those factors change, change the amount of grip you could put down on those tires. Right. That software now is a little bit smarter. And um, yeah, I think this is a record in terms of you know, us finding a problem, <laughs> right. an automaker reacting to it, and getting that fixed. Well, done. you know, I, w I want to throw it to Mike for a question because we've had automakers update uh, features on the vehicle based on our reports. But like Jake said, you know, the, the previous record was was much shorter, but still not as short as a Tesla. Sure. You know, uh, and, and well, it, it's, it's interesting to see that that some a lot of these automakers are going to respond to to what 
what, we, what we're talking about, whether it's criticisms with you know, really strange test results. And uh, a couple years ago, we had the new uh, Toyota Highlander and Sienna. It had, uh, I want to make sure I get this right, so I'm going to kind of read a little bit of it. It had a new eight-speed uh, automatic transmission, and we found that the transmission made the engine rev before upshifting, especially from second to third gear, even under light acceleration. So we talked about this because uh, people were saying to each other and in the, in the car's logbooks, what's wrong with this transmission? Right. And so we talked to Toyota about it. They came down and they, they looked it over and they said, yeah, I think we have a problem here. And they issued a, a, a technical service bulletin so people could go get their, their vehicles adjusted, which is, you know, yay for consumer reports and yay for automakers responding. But this certainly isn't the same thing as like an over the year update. Well, you still have to go to the dealership to have a TSB performed. Right. You know, this would potentially be a TSB in that world, but they were just able to push it right out. There's no paperwork. There's nothing. Just owners woke up and saw a screen. Right. I mean, Look, it's it's pretty cool that they were able to make mm-hmm. that change, and people don't have to bring it out to the dealership. I mean, I don't want to lose sight of the fact that it certainly would have been a lot better if the braking distance worked the begin. If with. it was shipped with, I mean, those, if yeah. it was shipped with those that yes. performance. But it's like that is a bit of concern. So it certainly would have been better if they got it right the first time. But certainly, kudos for them to being able to address it quickly. But I, I don't know how I would feel as an owner. It's it's one thing to get the next model year. You know, it's one thing to buy, you know, that, that Jeep, and then the next model year they'd say, oh, you know, we brought a new transmission or we fixed the seats or something. You know, you expect you're buying the 2017 or you're buying the 18. I, I don't know how I would feel because I don't own a Tesla to know that, well, the car I got this week All right. has been significantly updated. Do you, do you have one of these, John? <laughs> it's, it's, Come on, Grandpa. It's, no, no, no. no let's, just, let's just say it's one thing to have the updates of um, electronic, Okay. It's another thing to have a physical changes go on and so, on. So there's a couple of things. I mean, one is, yes, on these things, I think we're in a new world that, mm-hmm. that yeah, I do want this to improve as I own that. I think with the But if it came in with new, is, new glass, you know, partway through oh, and I would like such. That. Well, right. It, right, but what, how I would drop you, it now? Well, <laughs> right, but if you $60,000. No, but, but yes. the point is, so if I could... But again, if I could expect that mm-hmm. from here, why well, wouldn't I expect it from my $60,000 car? But, but I just want to, just one issue though. What you don't want to do is, oh, now I need to drive the car differently. Mm-hmm. Now the, my controls have moved from over here to there. So there's another concern that, you know, if I'm driving a car, if it's going to react differently or inter- the interface is going to change substantially, there could be concerns there in terms of safety. The, Not a lot of safety. Well, totally actually, on that. Some safety I'm thinking issues. the rest of the conversation and, and things we talked about that, you know, we addressed. Um, particularly maybe wind noise or something like that. Things are like, well, maybe we'll do this. It, it goes back to the shipping in the car probably. Like, if wind noise is a problem, <clears> why <throat> wasn't that looked at? Why is it this rush to deliver? I, I get and, it. I, I'm with John on this one. And now oh, I, own, I, I own a Model 3, but, oh, they, they made all this host of changes, running <clears throat> changes. That's but, it's, but, dis, but, it's disappointing at the price point, and it, it's disappointing to go into the whole kind of beta testing. So, beta testing of both software and, I think, hardware. I agree with you. I mean, certainly, I mean, if it's a safety issue, you got to work those mm-hmm. things out begin with. But let's not lose fact that there's plenty of old school, old tech cars out there that have a lot of problems. Certainly. I mean, mm-hmm. we test a lot of cars that do not test well, um, whether it be ride or noise or right down yep. the list. Yep. And no one sticks in those cars. They just stay bad. So, um, well, or they, or they well, might address would, suspension changes. I wouldn't change say they the don't model address year. them at all. I'm, yeah, well, next I model mean, year, but I mean, yeah. it would be great if they could right. improve them on the fly. Right. It certainly would. It, it would. Um, so you're saying I'm right? Um, no, no, no. no, no. <laughs> I said, I said, I understand the model year changes. It's the thing that you know. Two weeks later, all of a sudden, every, yeah. oh, everyone gets great windshields. I'm not. Now I have it, to have this car I, that I've waited I, and I, waited I and gave the them my deposit. Is, ideally, you want a good car to get better, not a bad car, and then. Yep. It's going to catch up. So what does this mean for the future of updates? And not just Tesla, but other manufacturers. Are they going to feel pushed that they have to do this type of thing? Well, I, I think they're feeling pushed, and I think they need to do it. But I think what they need to do is be do it smartly. So, I mean, look, we're seeing other automakers that are already doing things in terms of infotainment and, you know, give you more features. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you you're, you're no longer have the button for MySpace, but you now have it for, 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 for Friendster. Friendster right? yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're going from Pandora to Spotify or whatever it is. Right, right. But, but um but there's ways to misstep. So, I mean, we saw an issue with our Chryslers 
uh, before where our Jeep, we got it, and they put a, an over-the-air update, and suddenly the whole radio is not working. Well, yeah, I was going to ask, well, what happens if these over-the-air updates, the car gets worse? Well, <laughs> I mean, right, how, right, right. what happens when they mess it up? And right. again, going back to the smartphone, how often have you had an, an over-the-air update with your smartphone, and suddenly the thing's lagging, or the thing's right. locking up? That's because I wait till version 3 or 4 of the update. <laughs> well, right, and you shouldn't yeah. have to, especially if you have a car. So, I mean, this is the worst-case scenario. Suddenly there's an over-the-air update that they make a fix to improve your brakes, imagine, and suddenly the brakes aren't working. Right, right. So this is where... But we're not saying that in this case. No, we're not saying in this yes. case, but this is the danger of these over... Sure. I mean, really cool that they can improve things, but wow, they better get this stuff right. And there's ways of... I mean, fallback is, for instance, some of the things that we have talked about um, with our Washington office and policymakers, that if, say, you get that update, mm -hmm. Can I go back to the old update if something goes wrong? You can't save it on your desktop. <laughs> the old, the old, so the old right, version. Right, the old software. Yeah. So how do you? So th it has to be understood and has to be done safely. So I think that the, the grand takeaway: more to come in the sense of what's going to go forward with what we talked about the Tesla, but also more to come in the new paradigm of updating cars and and fixes. Sure. So uh, if you yeah. think about the evolution of cars, it took them maybe a hundred years to get the real hardware stuff right. Engines transmission suspensions. Now this is the second evolution of, of automotive technology and how, how long is it going to take for them to get all this right so you don't even have to think about it anymore. Yeah, yeah, yep. uh, good point. We're going to move to a much more conventional car now. We're going to move to the new, new vehicle in our fleet, Kia Sorento. Um, it's been t updated, not wholesale redesign, but, but updated. Mike, do you want to talk a little bit about the vehicle in the fleet? We've all driven it. Um, sure. Give us impressions and also what's changed. Uh, Sorento has been a, a really good performer for Consumer Reports, at times been a, a top pick in the SUV category. Uh, most trims these uh, for, for 2018 are going to get standard forward collision warning and automatic emergency braking. Not all of them, but most. Uh, we're testing the EX model with the V6 and a new 8-speed uh, automatic transmission. Uh, I'd just say just walking past it the other day in, in our parking lot, it didn't really look that different to me, yeah. but uh, I think we've all had a chance to drive it. I drove it last night, and um, it's sort of, to me, it's, it's a typical Kia. It's, you, you get into it, you immediately can figure out the controls. It really passes my rental car test. You fly into a city at night, you're tired, you have to rent a car, it's dark, you get into it, and in 10 seconds, you can adjust everything. You can right, adjust right. the climate system. You can adjust the radio. You know how to put it into gear. It's not a big thing. And that's what they do really, really, really well. Well, Jake, like Mike alluded to, you know, or, or said, um, ESC, uh, forward collision warning, excuse me, automatic emergency braking, lane departure warning, lane keeping assist, standard on EX and above. So that means the L, the LX, and the LXV6 don't get it. So mm -hmm. how's that A going to affect the car? But B, that's not... That's not necessarily progress, of, you know, as, as they're introducing an updated vehicle. Sure, yeah. I mean, in terms of how we're scoring it, we're looking for standard equipment across the board um, when it comes to these key safety features. Um, if, look, if, if these are features that are preventing crashes and potentially saving lives, mm -hmm. Why only provide it if you get the high level car? It right. doesn't quite make sense. You I can mean, afford the higher level car, you get you get safer. Right. I mean, could you imagine in a world that like, oh, if you get leather, then you get uh, the, the the full crumple zone. I mean, this right. doesn't make sense. Well, that was kind of like Honda's old approach. I mean, honestly, they, that you used to have to get the highest trim to get the most important. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it's not it's not uncommon even today with many many automakers. Mm -hmm. It's good that they're providing that equipment, but again. And we're not going to give you any points for it unless you make it a standard across the board. What do you think about driving it? It was great. I mean, I, I, I think, you know, Quinn, you, you got it right. I mean, it's like you get into it and it's kind of like um, no stress. Right. Right. I mean, it's, you know, even if you compare it to kind of some key competitors like the Highlander and the Pilot and even that Subaru Ascent that we recently drove, I mean, those vehicles feel bigger and bulkier. I mean, this is kind of like this sweet size where it's, you got the three rows, but it's just like, it feels more car-like. It's just really no stress, easy to maneuver, easy to park, um, drives quietly, mm -hmm. comfortably. I mean, this is kind of like the responsible choice. It's funny, when we're talking about Tesla, it's kind of like, you know, that's the excitement. This is kind of like the eat your vegetables. I mean, this is the car that you, <laughs> you, you should have. The broccoli have. Says, says a vegetarian. The, yeah. <laughs> the broccoli of our test. Right, yeah. right. Well, I mean, like you said, so eight-speed automatic is now standard, but only on the V6 versions. All trims get three rows of seat standard, but, you know, it's not, oh, we could fit three adults. It's, it's that kind of in a pinch carrying little kids right. around. It's functional. You know, it's yeah. functional. All trims get Android Auto and Apple CarPlay. 
Um, I felt a little little weird in some kind of like rolling transitions. You know, you you come up to a corner, there's not a stop sign, so you kind of ease into the throttle to make a turn. And like, I really felt I have to go deep in it. I that's the only place that I felt it was odd. The rest of it was like you said, like yeah. it's quiet. It, Drives nicely. It's got nice trim. Ours is a little dour looking. It's dark. It's black on black on black with a little silver trim. But you know that's just what we got. I mean, there's other colors. It's it's an it's unremarkable, but it's very competent in being unremarkable. Uh, not flashy, but what, one really interesting uh, comment that I saw uh, in, the, in the logbook this morning when I came to work is um, I like this more than the Lexus RX, and I thought that yes. was really significant because that because the, our tested RX was fifty eight thousand dollars. And an REX Sorento is about 41. And I, I, I see, I, I see the appeal of that statement because, because of, the, of its livability, because it's so easy day in, day out. Um, I, I find it more appealing than the RX yeah. as well. Just I think the that's touch spot screen on. on. Yeah, Just the, exactly. the infotainment system. Well, it's, it, it, it really comes down to, you know, are you buying, you know, form or function? You know, I mean, this is a car that's not exciting to look at. It's not something, oh, check out my new, you know, Kia it's to totally your friends. Anonymous, yes. But it's, you know, if you're not concerned about that and you don't want to be showy, wow, it's, it's, it's a great, it's a great value. So, you know, we're putting miles on it. It'll be, be online. Members will be able to see our, uh, our full review uh, when we're done testing it. So we'll have some information on consumerreports.org. We're going to move to uh, viewer questions now. And the first one we have is a really good video question. So let's take a look at it. I have a question about the 2019 Forester that's coming out this fall. Since it is a new generation, how does Subaru do compared to other car manufacturers when they redo a car or a SUV? They seem to roll out many of their changes in other models. And so like the Impreza and the Crosstrek and this global platform seems to be something that maybe they have a lot of the issues ironed out. What do you think about the Forester? Will it have uh, better than average reliability for a car that has, is a new generation? I'd really look forward to uh, hearing your answers. And I'm so glad to be on this show. Thanks, guys. So, Mike, uh, what do you think about the question about the Forester, and, and what kind of advice do you do you want to give? Well, it, 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 it's not always a slam dunk that that uh, a, a manufacturer that typically has good reliability in consumer reports surveys is going to knock it out of the park, uh, or, you know, from the first at bat. And and really, uh, the, the, when you think about the first year of the redesigned Impreza, that kind of fell flat. We, the, the reliability was down mostly for in-car electronics, but, but that prevented us from recommending the Impreza. So uh, listen, Subaru has a lot riding on this car. Uh, they know how, <clears throat> how popular the Forester is, and, and you think that maybe they learned something from mm -hmm. their launch of the Impreza, but I, I, it's, it's, it's not a slam dunk in my opinion. Jake, you talked about in, in some pre-meetings about confidence in the platform because it's, it's not even though the Farch is redesigned, it's it's not its first rodeo for the platform, so to speak. Right. So, so certainly with any redesigned model, you know, there's a little concern. We we see routinely the reliability does dive when vehicles get redesigned. Um, however, with you sometimes have to look past that. So, and what you look past is you look at the platform. So you look at the Impreza. The Impreza was actually a new platform for Subaru. And just platform being platform being so basically it's a lot in common so you know you look at the, the way suspension works and the way the 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 uh, the um, infotainment uh, the electrical architecture I mean basically you know there's there's what over you know 250 models that we rate I mean they're not all completely different here's the secret right I mean there's a lot of even from brand to brand sometimes. even from brand to brand I mean yeah. there's a lot of shared componentry with these vehicles I mean you can't go completely you know develop each one it's separately. hard the Tesla Found out of it developing <laughs> from a clean slate. Well, but I mean, and they share platforms. Exactly. Right? The Model yeah. X and the S are exactly very, very similar. Same platform. So anyway, so establishing this, so so the Impreza was kind of a big step for them. Um, but they're using that same platform for another vehicle, the Subaru Ascent, that's coming out. You know, after that, and then the third will be this Forester. So again, a little bit more confidence, just because it's kind of the third vehicle from this platform. But still, you know, if you're looking about looking for reliability, if that is your number one uh, concern, you're going to be better off getting the last one in the old generation right. than yes. the first one in the new generation, and they're still for sale. And and if you look and you kind of squint, they always look the same anyway. So. Right. Yeah, because the last generation they worked out all the kinks by the time they're ready to right. get rid of it. 
But, but I mean, well, look, looking the same of, <laughs> which, of, any, of everyone, any, of everyone. Right, and yeah. looking at, at Subaru's um, you know, used car reliability, it's it's definitely mixed. It's not it's not all uh, in, in Consumer Reports uh, sim- symbology. It's not all straight green upper arrows. It's it's a little bit of everything. So yeah, like yeah. any car, but, you know, that things happen over time. Right, they're still above average. Uh, it's, yeah. Yeah, it's it's easy in most cases to recommend Subarus mm-hmm. to people. Okay, so we're going to jump to another question from a longtime viewer who sent us some video questions, some some text questions, and this is the one that hit the sweet spot. So, no, here we go. I want to know how long hybrid engines last compared to non-hybrid cars. I'm asking because a hybrid engine doesn't come on until later when you're already driving. So you're revving a cold engine at high RPM when it initially turns on. This repeats all the time during the car's life cycle. Is it really cheaper to get a hybrid if your engine doesn't last as long as a non-hybrid? I don't know if we'd say that doesn't last as long as a non-hybrid. Jake, technically, is that is that really always happening? The engine's totally cold when it pops on? Well, we don't have data to support kind of this theory, okay. right? I mean, first of all, the theory is that since the engine's going off and on, you get more cold starts. Right. Okay, and that's kind of a logical theory, um, except with hybrids, the engine doesn't stay off that long. Hmm. So you're not really getting a, a cold start. So you're getting it going off and going on again, but it's still warm. Mm-hmm. And if you're not convinced of that, um, drive a hybrid in the winter. Um, every time the engine shuts off, you're not losing your heat because the heat is from that warm engine. Mm-hmm. So realistically, you're not having that issue. And when you look at our data, um, it doesn't support that there's a problem with hybrid engines. Well, you have a first hand experience besides the, the drift car and the MR2 track. Toy, the MR2 track car, you also have a, a Prius in the family. He's got a Prius track my, car. My, my <laughs> wife has. Your Prius drag, drag racer. My, my wife has a 2006 Prius, uh, which she owned from new. And um, yeah, I mean, just trouble, trouble free from that. But again, she drives around in the winter and she doesn't have, you know, you know the engine doesn't stay off that much. Um, and um, yeah, but my son is actually looking to buy that car now, and he wants to drop it and turn that into a drift car. I'm not sure how that's oh. going to work. Is he going to put the slicks in the big tires in the back where they have no value, or some big yeah, tires in the front? That's a good question. Yeah. So if anyone wants to ask about that, we could answer that. Okay. Next, Coffee episode. next, next question. <laughs> Mike, you know, what about, have, you know, again, data on this? Have we well, seen... it, was, it was a great question, and, and so we kind of you know, dove in a little bit deeper on our data. We have, we have 17 years of data on the, the Toyota Prius, so it's really pretty stout. Mm-hmm. And, and there's, there's, it has ne- nearly a perfect score. For, for engines, major engines, minor, as we like to say. Right, the, the problem. Uh, so, so, I mean, it, if, if you're thinking about any anything that might happen with a hybrid, I would say, at least according to the data that we have with with a Prius, it's not going to be the gasoline engine that's going to go wrong. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I, I would say it would be interesting to see how some of the cars that, well, you know, even the uh, like the, the Clarity, the Honda Clarity fuel cell, where it, just, it runs purely on that, but it doesn't. You know, the engine does kick in. Well, and, and even that, that so you, you're talking about plug-in hybrid. Yep. So plug-in hybrid, you know, you drive your first 30 or 50 right, miles right. or whatever it is, and the engine's off. But once it kicks on, it pretty much stays on and stays warm. So it's, again, not, not that kind and of thing. And it's like talking about a cold start on any, you know, conventional Vehicle, right. you know, you're, you're cold starting it every morning and you don't have major engine sure. failures so, just because of cold starting there. I think it comes down to the manufacturer. So, I mean, you know, we mentioned Prius, but again, Prius, you know, Toyota doesn't generally have issues with engines with at their, all. Particularly right. their hybrid. Um, right. yeah. If you have a hybrid from another automaker um, that has sometimes more more problematic, you might have some engine mm-hmm. problems too. But I don't think you're more or less likely based on it being a hybrid. So that's going to wrap it up for this episode. As always, send us your questions and your video submissions to TalkingCars at iCloud.com. Also, check the show notes below because we have a lot of information on the topics we discussed and when in the podcast they appeared. As always, thanks for watching and see you next time.